All right, and now the mystery talk title has been revealed. So some of you are wondering, oh no, how do I get out of this room now that I've seen this talk title very carefully? Um, so sorry for, for the last minute talk title. Um, it's interesting that also somewhat of a last minute talk because I only found out Friday that I'm actually giving two talks. Uh, so I'm also giving a talk tomorrow and I just did the foolish thing of looking at the schedule to see what my talk would be. And I saw a talk on Monday and I said, great, talks on Monday. And I started thinking about what that talk would be. And then as I was thinking about the conference and coming on Friday, and I was like, I wonder what else is gonna be at this conference, you know? And then I looked on Tuesday and my name was there again, you know? So uh, surprise to me, uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. However, I'll just say without embarrassing the person that at lunch today, I just informed another speaker that this speaker has a second talk at the conference. <laughs> so I was not the only one that made this mistake. So this is um, going to be very different, actually. I noticed that I'm squeezed between two hardcore statistics talks, like power and FDR correction and all this sort of really complicated stuff. So I think I'm kind of like the, the, the sort of light entertainment in between them um, with no statistics. Uh, now, when you see evolution, Maybe the first thing that comes to mind is species evolution. And of course, that's a really important and, and well-researched topics. And, and there's some experts here at CGSI in, that, in this topic. But as you can see in the second part of this title, uh, I'm not going to talk about species evolution. I'm going to talk about evolution that occurs uh, somatically. And you know, mutations happen pretty much every time a cell divides in, in the body. And uh, most of the time, these mutations are sort of inconsequential for the organism. Uh, but occasionally, mutations happen in a part of the genome that you know, is a gene that regulates growth and causes that cell to grow quickly or evade the immune system. And then that leads to um, uh, eventually a tumor. Right? So this is a sort of classic example of somatic evolution. Um, but as I said, mutations happen all the time. So you could imagine that you know, just if you were to measure individual cells in an organism, like in a human, there would be somatic mutations in almost every single one of our cells that distinguish our, uh, the cell from, from the original zygote. So you could also think about trying to track uh, just normal developmental processes uh, using somatic mutations. And through a variety of, of great technologies, which I'll, I'll sort of mention a bit, but it's not the genomic technologies talk, uh, uh, section, so I won't spend too much time on that, um, say that you know, we can now measure single cells uh, from, from you know, many, many different uh, cells in a tissue, and then try to reconstruct these past processes, these past evolutionary processes, or this past sort of lineage process. All right, so just to you know, get everyone on the, on the same setting here, um, with single cell sequencing, and there's, there's different technologies. I'm going to show you uh, one in a few slides. Um, you can imagine that the type of data you get is for each of you know, hundreds or thousands of cells, you measure some locations in the genome where there have been mutations. And the phylogenesis called these characters for some strange reason. Uh, but each mutation is a, a locus, a, a character in the genome. And you record here its state in that cell. And here I've shown a very simple uh, character. It's had of only two states, uh, 0 and 1. So um, if, if, uh, if we then think about how we might recover uh, a tree from this data, we think that these, uh, each row here corresponds to a leaf of the tree, which is something we measure at the present time. And then we try to infer back in time the ancestral process and the ancestral mutations according to some evolutionary model. Okay? And that's what I want to actually talk uh, a, a bit about is what these evolutionary models are and what they might be that are appropriate for these different uh, types of somatic mutation processes. So if we start thinking about single cell phylogeny, uh, there are a few key questions uh, for how we might build these phylogenetic trees. So one question would be, what mutations do we want to use as our phylogenetic characters? Um, now, in cancer, it turns out that we have a wide variety of choices because mutations occur across all genomic scales, not just single nucleotide changes in DNA, but larger duplications or deletions of regions of the genome, uh, or even you know, duplications or deletions of whole chromosomes, or even wild events where the whole genome duplicates, and you get four copies of every chromosome instead of two. So all of these are possible phylogenetic characters, uh, and we, we have to make a choice as to which ones we might use, or we could attempt to use them all. 
All right, then the next question, how reliably can we measure these characters? And unfortunately, for pretty much every single cell sequencing uh, technology, there's, there's pretty high rates of missing data and errors. So we need to think about how we might um, make, use the uh, account for that. And then the third question, which is perhaps a question that, that is not always uh, asked so much, is what model do we want to use to describe the evolution of these characters? And these three questions are all related to each other, actually. Because if I say that I want to uh, you know, measure uh, my uh, evolutionary process using you know, duplication and deletion events, then I need a model that describes how duplication and deletion events change the genome. right? Uh, so how could we you know, describe the, the, these different models? So we're going to actually, for the first parts, to think about sort of single nucleotide mutations, but very simple characters. Okay, and every evolutionary model uh, can be described as something that I'll, I'll call the, the state transition graph. Not really standard terminology, but it's, it's uh, close to the terminology that uh, is used in the literature. So here's a very, very simple example. So here's a, a tree again, a phylogenetic tree on, on three leaves. What I'm showing you are two characters, all right? One character, the first character here, has two states, which you know, as a computer scientist, I'll label zero and one, right? The other one has four states, which as a biologist will label A, C, T, and G. Right? Okay, so now you can see the mutations that I've labeled on the edges of the tree to indicate when there are changes in state of each character, right? So this yellow mutation is when the C changed to an A, that second character, okay? So what model should we use to describe both the allowed transitions and the probabilities or score or weights of these transitions? So we might think of having a very unrestricted model, and this is what's called the finite states model, where we can describe this via a graph, where every node of the graph is one of the states of our character. So here I'm showing you this a possible state transition graph for the second character. There are four states. Then I'll have directed edges indicating which transitions are allowed to occur over the evolutionary process. Okay, So here you, you see that I've... Uh, uh, I think I missed a few, actually. Um, this was supposed to have every possible transition, uh, but I did miss a few directed edges, as you can see. Uh, and I've shown you here with labels, you know, again, this C to A transition is this directed edge right here. And if I put, you know, weights on these edges, I can turn that into a parsimony type score, which you might have heard about. If I put probabilities on these edges, I can turn that into a likelihood score. Okay. So this is the most classic model. This is the in a way, model that allows all transitions with different rates or probabilities. Uh, there's versions of this that you might have heard of with different, uh, if the rates are very specific, this is called the Jukes-Cantor model for, for DNA evolution. But we could think of actually doing more restrictive models. And here's actually the sort of opposite extreme, where I have an evolutionary model that has for a character only two states, zero and one. Zero goes to one, but not the reverse. So that's not allowed. And then there's this other constraint, which I illustrate here with this little, I don't know, Pac-Man type character, which is that that transition is only allowed to happen once over the whole evolutionary history. And this is a very famous model, actually, sometimes called the infinite sites assumption, the no homoplasy model, or sometimes called the two-state perfect phylogeny model. And this is, if you think about it, essentially the most constrained evolutionary model you could have. Right? And this red mutation right here on this particular tree actually follows this model. Right? You can see it changed, this first character changed from 0 to 1 only once on the whole tree. And that's all that happened with that character. Very, very simple model. All right? And these are essentially the two extremes. Uh, no constraints, any transitions are allowed with certain score or probability, or very constrained. The character has only one uh, uh, transition, only one change in state over the whole tree. Okay? Yeah, question. So, why did you have different characters zero and one? And here it's A, C, T, T. Yeah. Ah, right. So, you know, this, this again would be, um, uh, you know, yeah, so how do you model the specific character? So, if you're thinking about uh, DNA sequence, right, there are a priori four possible uh, letters we could have, nucleotides. So, it seems natural to have a four state character. However, most of the time in many somatic evolutionary processes and even in population genetics, 
uh, many lo loci that we see never exhibit all four of those states. So they might only exhibit two or three. Right? If they exhibit one state, they're uninteresting for any sort of inference. Um, so population genetics, sometimes biallelic SNPs, you might have heard that term, where there's only um, two of the four possible uh, 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 states. OK, so um, wh why, why might we want to use a more constrained evolutionary model? Why do, why do people actually do it? So this model I, I actually mentioned in population genetics is used. In cancer evolution, it's used. And one of the reasons it's used a lot in, in cancer genomics, and in single cell sequencing in particular, is that by using a constrained model, we can um, avoid sort of overfitting the data when there's high rates of, of uh, missing data and errors. Okay? So if we allow you know, any transitions, then we sort of start conflating the error process and the mutational process. And if we think that, we have good reason to think that perhaps you know, uh, it's rare that a mutation would, would change back from zero to one. We make this infinite size assumption. It becomes valuable to use this uh, in our phylogenetic approach. Okay, So two states per phylogeny, widely used in cancer genomics. Finite states, widely used in species evolution. But it turns out there's a bunch of other, perhaps less well-known models that are kind of in between these two. Uh, it's a model called the Dolo model, something called the Kamen Sokol model, and there's actually a few others. All right, and what I want to show you in the next several minutes is actually two other new models that we recently described for dealing with two different applications. One is tumor phylogeny, and this is going to be a model called the constrained K Dolo model. Uh, I've already shown you here the state transition graph, so if that all makes sense to you, you don't have to listen to me describe it. And another is for normal development for experiments uh, that induce mutations to track uh, cell lineage. Uh, and because of the way these experiments work, this leads to a model that we dubbed the star homoplasy model with this state transition graph. All right, so let's uh, sort of look first at the tumor phylogeny application. And this work was motivated actually by a very specific data set. So we we're working with, uh, and still are working with, Chris Abusio Donahue's group at MSK. Uh, who is, she's a, a pancreatic cancer expert, and she's done this amazing sequencing of all sorts of pancreatic cancer samples. And in particular, they've been using now some single cell sequencing technologies, and the technology they were using here is one from a company called Mission Bio. It's called the Tapestry Platform. And what it does is it uh, does what's called targeted single cell sequencing. So it doesn't sequence the whole genome. It sequences uh, targeted regions of the genome, about 500 targeted regions, each about 200 base pairs. This is a PCR-based technique. Uh, but what you can get is really high coverage, read coverage, of those targeted amplicons in thousands of cells, all from the same experiment. Okay? So if you think about how we identify mutations in the genome, if I've got you know, 50 reads covering an amplicon, I can very reliably call single nucleotide mutations, maybe sort of small indels. Uh, but because I've sequenced so little of the genome, I have less, I almost want to say power, although I don't have a statistical argument, but less power to uh, identify these larger copy number aberrations. And actually, it's even trickier to do this because they're in the experiment, because it's PCR-based. You sometimes have whole amplicon dropout things that actually look like copy number aberrations. So if one wants to build a phylogeny from this data, it seems to make sense to use a model for, that uses single nucleotide mutations as the phylogenetic characters. And since there's high rates of, of missing data and errors in, 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 these, in these measurements, um, and since you know, this is a, a tumor and we think that maybe it's pretty unlikely that the exact same single nucleotide mutation will have occurred, same position, you know, same mutation, during the evolution of this tumor. So if we make this infinite sites assumption, or this perfect phylogeny assumption, it's become a standard thing to do in, in cancer evolution, uh, then we can start to try to reconstruct a, a phylogeny. So here's actually the data. This is like data seems so ridiculously silly, because it's seven mutations. Right? So we're going to build a phylogeny with these seven mutations. Uh, and, and here they are. You know, It's uh, black here if it's present, so this is this. Uh, mutation matrix, you know, white, the mutation is not measured. Uh, red here is missing, meaning like we didn't even have any reads covering that part of the genome, so we just don't know if the mutation was there or not in that cell. Okay? And so if we go run 
one of the state-of-the-art methods for doing this perfect phylogeny um, model. What we get is a tree that looks like this on, on these seven mutations. All right, there it is. Uh, but what it actually starts to infer, because it's forced to make this assumption that mutations are gained only once, to fit things into a tree, it starts assuming that there's really high rates of false negatives in the data. Okay, so this like constrained model has forced these really high rates of missing data. So this is uh, this uh, mutation BRCA2, uh, and what you can see is that this mutation, the way the tree is, is fit, is that it should be like in all cells. So what it's really doing is it's imputing this mutation in these cells for which it was not actually measured. All right, so one could you know, ask, well, you know, why, maybe we should just go to the fully unrestricted model, and people have done that, and that solves some of the problems, but uh, can introduce other problems. So what if we take a sort of, you know, step away from perfect phylogeny and sort of think about the process uh, itself and think about, you know, these, these uh, single nucleotide mutations and the fact that we've allowed them to uh, uh, be gained only once. And it turns out that actually these mutations are lost frequently, they go back to the one state, but they don't go, sorry, they, from the one state, they go back to the zero state. So one here is the mutation present, zero is the mutation absent. But the reason they go from mutation present to mutation absent is not because the nucleotide reverts back. There isn't a mutation of that same nucleotide back. Instead, the whole locus, the whole region gets deleted because deletions are very common in cancer. So if you think of this particular now diagram of here's now sort of a prototypical cell. We've got two copies of this chromosome. This is the zero state, no mutation. Uh, mutations introduced on one of the copies here. So now we're in the one state. And now if we remove this chromosome, it's lost, the one that has the mutation, then we go back to this other state, which you know, looks to us if we're just measuring presence or absence of this mutation, like the zero state. Of course, it's not the zero state. Something different has happened, right? So a mutation, single nucleotide mutations, it's a zero state. Uh, if you think about these copy number aberrations, it's, it's more complicated. So could we relax just a little bit this, this model of perfect phylogeny? And this is uh, a model that's called the K-DOLO model. So what's happened here? We still assume that a mutation happens only once. It's gained only once in the evolution of the tree. But then it can revert back any number of times. And we allow some maximum here, K. So this is sort of modeling that there's going to be a losses, gains only once. That's a mutation happening. But then because of these deletions that occur, can be lost many times. And so this K-DOLO model uh, was introduced and, and used for single cell sequencing by uh, Mohammed El-Kabir, who's in the audience, and, and he had a method, which I never know if I'm supposed to, is it Sapphire or Sphere, or how are you supposed to say that? Sapphire, all right, it's pronounced Sapphire. And so we run Sapphire, and it does something actually quite interesting. It says that all mutations are lost on the tree. So this is kind of interesting. There's only seven mutations. They're all gained, and then they all just get lost in different cells which seems strange and perhaps uh, unlikely. Uh, and part of what's happening here is that the model being more flexible uh, starts just allowing these losses to happen anywhere. This is what would happen also if you go to this finite states model. Um, you just start getting a process that, because of the high rates of missing data and errors, start m making those into transitions, mutations. Okay, Hard to distinguish between the two. So uh, when, when my postdoc, uh, Palash, whose name and picture I'll show in a second, sort of you know, showed this to me, and he said, um, hey, I want to work on a new model. And I said, wait, we've already actually solved this problem because we um, published a, a paper a few years ago um, with a method that looks a little bit at where these copy number changes happen, these deletions and duplications, uh, and allows these losses of the mutation only when there's data in the reads to say that there's been a deletion. So it sort of constrains where these losses can happen. We call the supported uh, loss model. Uh, and, and so we, um, we, we did this. And, uh, and, and, and the only problem was that we couldn't actually, with this targeted data, identify where the copy number aberrations were. So what Palash proposed was that we could do something sort of interesting and in between, which is we could allow these losses, but allow them only between certain groups of cells. Because what he noticed was that he could take 
the whole profile, all the reads across all the cells, and he could group the cells by their read counts into these coherent groups of cells or clusters, which are driven by these changes in, in, in copy number at different loci. Uh, this is a Tisney plot, sorry. It should probably be UMAP or whatever the current state of the art is for making these, these things. Fate map, who knows. But anyway, there's these three clusters. Uh, and, and so could we use actually this clustering to constrain where the losses would be. So here, if we have these three clusters, we would allow the losses to occur only between the clusters. And I think, you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip through these slides quickly to sort of say you can write all this down. It leads to this sort of interesting model where you've constrained these losses in a particular way. You've constrained them based on how you've clustered the rows of the matrix. Okay, and it sort of interpolates between uh, the perfect phylogeny model where there's no losses. So you don't get very good phylogeny. It's sort of too cold. The soup is too cold. This K-Dolo model where losses can happen anywhere, and so they start to happen anywhere, and then you get losses that uh, uh, are too many. So it's right in between, sort of just right, and seems to work pretty well. So there's a nice combinatorial formulation of this. You can write all this down. You can prove things about this model. Uh, you can show what the constraints are that you, know, you need to meet. And then you can wrap all these constraints into a uh, integer linear programming. And this is what uh, Palash uh, Sashital, as a postdoc in my group, uh, had done. He named this method Condor for the constrained dolo reconstruction. Okay? So uh, again, what it does is it takes the mutations here measured via, via the read counts, as well as a clustering of the cells. And then it builds a phylogeny based on the read counts of the mutations, as well as constrained by the groupings of the cells. All right. uh, works well. I'm not going to show you the simulations. And then in practice, on this data, something quite uh, uh, interesting and we think sort of useful happens because we can see that actually the, um, uh, when we run on, on the 2,000 cells from these two different regions of the, of the pancreatic tumor, we see a nice tree where it's well split between the two regions. This was not imposed. This is what happens. We throw all the cells together. But most of the cells from one region end up on one branch of the tree. Most of the cells from the other region end up on the other branch of the tree. And there's only two mutations that are lost. And in fact, these two mutations are in the same gene. So it's really just a single gene loss. So many fewer losses than what was uh, obtained with this K-Dolo model and much more reasonable than what's obtained with a fully constrained two states model. Now, we can also sort of run this on, on, on other uh, uh, data sets. Um, you can actually sort of look at single cell sequencing data sets of metastatic cancers. And when you have different trees for tumors where there's measurements of both primary tumors and metastasis, and when you build the tree, and then you look at where those cells were located, it tells you something about um, the migration process of cells uh, uh, between these anatomical sites. And so uh, the original publication that had analyzed this, this metastatic uh, colorectal cancer data set had, had uh, found this uh, polyclonal seeding where cells multiple times left the primary tumor and went to the metastasis. And what we can um, do with actually our older method, but now uh, recapitulate with, with Condor and a little bit better, uh, see that actually there was really only a single event where cells left the primary tumor and seeded the metastasis in the liver. All right, now we're at three, but actually we started a few minutes late. And I, I want to, if I can, take five minutes to show you lineage tracing. So you can see all this, a preprint. It's, it's, in, it's, it's coming out soon in, in review. Um, but let's look very quickly in five minutes at, at the second model. Um, so here uh, we're looking at um, developmental processes, right? So we'd like to just build the tree from cells at the present time that, that reconstruct. You know, wouldn't it be amazing if you could you know, reconstruct all cellular divisions from uh, a human you know, the, the, up to back to the original fertilized egg? That seems actually nearly impossible to do. Uh, however, it has been done for C. elegans, which has just 959 cells, a very laborious process that, in the end, resulted in a Nobel Prize to Sidney Brenner and others, where they constructed the whole lineage tree of C. elegans. And once you have this tree, then you can start looking at what the ancestral cell, cell states are. You can start learning a lot about development based on uh, being able to couple what you can measure about cell state along with lineage. Now, 
doing this for human uh, in the way they did it is, is just completely impossible, right? You can't directly measure the process as it goes. Um, we can't sequence enough single cells with high resolution to do this retrospectively because mutations uh, occur too infrequently naturally. So we'd have to sequence the whole genome of many cells in order to do this. So the approach that's been taken recently is to use genome editing technologies to induce somatic mutations at particular locations in the genome that then we can read out via single cell sequencing. And there's a number of different ways to do this. Uh, and, and our collaborator uh, introduced uh, one of these approaches based on the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And so what's done here is a lot of sort of details, but it's really just induced genome edits uh, at particular locations in the genome. And because of the way CRISPR works, uh, you build these, these uh, guide, array, uh, uh, guide RNAs at particular uh, locations. Here are these cassettes. You introduce multiple cassettes in different parts of the genome. Uh, the guide RNA guides CRISPR to edit this part of the genome as the uh, organism is, is, is developing, and that edit will result in an indel. And you can get many, many different indels that occur at these particular locations. But once the deletion, once the indel, insertion and deletion has happened, the guide RNA is no longer present, and so the mutations are irreversible. You never get a mutation at the same, an edit at the same location again. And moreover, there's actually another process. Not only does the mutation not revert to the ancestral state, but you can't introduce a new mutation at the same location either. So this is what's called non-modifiable. So now our evolutionary process has many states, because you have many different edits at a particular location. It can't go back to the ancestral state, but it also can't change once it's reached a particular state. So now we can think about these state transition graphs and what this should look like. And I should say that the other cool thing about this is that the readout is single cell RNA-seq, which is cheap, so you can get this from many cells. So you get this readout and you try to revert back. And the data is really messy, okay? There's large numbers of uh, possible states because you can get many, many different indels. So if we think of a phylogenetic character, Instead of having two states, 0, 1, or four states like ACTG, you could have 50 to 100 different states at a particular location. There's many missing entries, and they have this special property. So what's the evolutionary model that, that could capture these types of characteristic features? And if you think about the usual finite states model where nothing is constrained, certainly you can do this model with as many states as you want. but it, is not irreversible, right? Every transition could happen, and it's not non-modifiable. It's inherently modifiable, right? Any transition can happen at any time. So this is not the state transition graph that we need. We need something more constrained. And if you think for a minute about what these properties should be, what you end up getting is a graph that looks like this, where this is the ancestral state. Before CRISPR edits this site, CRISPR can edit it into, I'm sorry, this is the one. CRISPR can edit it into any one of these possible derived states. But once it's done that, that's it. There's no more edits at that location. So this is what's called a star graph. And so this leads to what's called the star homoplasy model. Homoplasy because at different locations in the tree, the same location could be edited. Just once it's edited in a cell, it's done. So this is actually quite fun and interesting because what how do you compute this model? And can you compute this model? Could you actually look at one of these matrices, which now has 0, 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, up to the number of states? Could you look at one of those matrices and tell me whether it was a star homoplasy matrix? Does it meet this model? It actually turns out to be a hard problem. And then given that, could you find the tree? So it's a hard problem, but again, it's got this nice combinatorial structure. And now I'm almost at 30 minutes, so I'm out of time. So I can't tell you the model, but you can write it down. You can relate it to other models, and particularly you can relate it to this perfect phylogeny model in a very interesting way. And then you can, again, derive a combinatorial algorithm to solve this model in the maximum parsimony setting. And then if you do that, you can apply it, and you can find actually interesting things in data. And I'm just going to show you one quickly. This is a really what probably one of the largest lineage tracing uh, uh, studies uh, there where this was CRISPR editing in a mouse model of cancer. Uh, so they had uh, induced uh, cancer in these mice. They then not only uh, were, were sort of measuring mutations in these, which is interesting, but they were also measuring lineage. 
Uh, so then you could, from these different uh, sites where there was cancer and the cancer spread to different metastatic sites, you could measure the lineage. You could build a tree on all 20,000 cells. So here's the published phylogeny. Uh, and here's our phylogeny. You can't really see much from this because it's at least 20,000 cells. But the interesting thing about the phylogeny is, one, ours is more parsimonious because we used a model that actually models the CRISPR editing process. So it's a more parsimonious model. This is uh, sort of, you know, that's, that's what the uh, objective should have been optimizing. So that's sort of a good thing. But it actually says something different about the metastatic process, because when you use the different tree, and then you look at how many times did cells migrate between these metastatic sites, you get a different result when you have a different tree. So you actually get a more parsimonious explanation of the metastasis. All right, so that's sort of the summary of this one. Also a preprint, uh, and this was at Recom earlier this year, and it should come out soon uh, in cell systems, we believe. So that's the sort of summary, very different, uh, no statistics. A lot of combinatorics that I didn't show you, but sort of playing this game of tailoring your evolutionary model to the particular features of your data. And rather than use sort of the generic model, if you use a model that's more uh, specific to the features of your data, you can actually get, in some cases, we think better results. So I'll end there. There's the folks that have worked on some of this and, and our collaborators uh, for the cancer part and Michelle Chan for the uh, lineage tracing part. Thank you.